After I had kind of decided I was going to stop running, I was going to refocus my energies on going back to school. And we can talk a little bit about that later. I opened my mailbox and I have a letter from the IRS informing me that I owe about $8,000 worth of taxes on all of the equipment that Nike had sent to Beyond the Ball Podcast. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of the Beyond the Ball podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Jones. And as always, we, we managed to find these amazing individuals. We managed to just get in contact with these amazing guests. And, and we're going to get to our guests in just one moment. But just want to do a quick recap, just in case you are not familiar with the Beyond the Ball podcast. The focus of this podcast and the focus of this platform is to ultimately serve and support student athletes by way of sharing stories, strategies, and successes. So for today, uh, I'm, I'm excited to, to have our guest, Miss Brianna Nelson. She's a former uh, track athlete, former Division One track athlete. Now she's a, a financial analyst as well as an entrepreneur. But before I let her come to the stage, I just have to read off just some of this resume because I saw it and I was like, oh my gosh. Wow, she is running circles literally uh, around the game being seven-time first-team All-American, being a five-time second-team All-American, 2013 Big 12 indoor champion, four by 400 meter relay, distance medley relay, 2013 World University Games competitor, 400 meters, 13-time All-Big 12, and I'm 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 just gonna stop there. I'm I'm gonna stop there. But there is more people. I just want to let you all know there is so much more. So Brianna, how are you doing today? Welcome to Beyond the Ball. Yes, I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Definitely, definitely. I, I mean, I'm I'm definitely excited to have a track star in the building. Uh, track star now just turned financial star. So is is there anything that that I missed or I didn't cover? Or let me put it like this: if if you wanted to give the people a brief snippet of who you are. This is their first interaction with you. I'll just kick it to you and, and let you just do that at this time. Yeah, so I think that you did a great job in going over some of my track accolades. I was a college student athlete at the University of Texas. I think that one accolade that you missed, which I think is my, which one I hold nearest to me is that I actually won a national championship in 2014, that four by four relay. So I can say that I'm, I'm an NCAA national champion. Um, I went on to run track professionally. I signed a contract with Nike um, and then transitioned into what I'm doing now, which um, is working as a financial analyst um, at Capital One. And so it's definitely been a journey. I'm excited to share all about it, but um, yeah, that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> Man, amazing, amazing. I mean, wow. Like, well, well, first and foremost, I'm curious because you said you were signed by Nike. Like, what, what does that feel? What has that feel to be like, signed by Nike. I mean, that's, that's a dream come true. Like how did, just, just walk us through that a little bit. I'm curious. Yeah. So, um, I guess going back to my college experience, I actually had a rough first three years at the university of Texas and like being able to perform at the level that I did, um, in high school, I was a pretty good and like standout track athlete in high school. But fortunately for me, my senior year, I had a breakout season and I ran really well, which afforded me the opportunity to sign a contract with Nike. And I think that um, it, it, it felt great because Nike is one of those brands that everybody knows, the top sporting brand. And so to sign with them, um, it came with a lot of perks and benefits, but I will say that it came with like a lot of lessons and there were some drawbacks about it that I didn't know going in as well. Mm. So I learned a lot um, and a lot of what I learned inspired me to get into the field that I'm working in today within finance and and kind of starting my business on financial education. So in short, to answer your question, it, it felt amazing and it feels amazing today to be able to say that I signed with Nike, but I will say that it wasn't all peaches and cream because it there, there, were, there was a lot that came with it, um, a lot of pressures that came along with it. Um, but in hindsight, I'm really grateful for that opportunity and it, it was a great opportunity. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, feel free to keep your long stories long because this episode <laughs> is all about you. So feel free to take your time with your stories and, you know, just feel free to share as much as you want to share or, you know, pull back when, when you when you desire to pull back. But if, if you're willing to share, I'm curious because you said there were some like drawbacks and I mean, like, like for, for somebody who might see that and then aspire towards getting that or somebody who might see that and say, that's what I want to do or this is where I want to be. Like, do you mind just sharing some of those, like just I'm, some some pitfalls or talk, talk to us, talk to us, Brianna. Sure, us. sure, absolutely. So I'm happy to share. And I, I wish that I had someone share this with me prior to um, me signing, um, but there's a few things. So I think that, um, and I assume that a lot of athletes are listening in, but I think that one of the main things for me is that I started running track when I was nine years old, right? And the track was just what I love to do. It was my passion um, throughout high school. Um, but once I got to college, it became more of a business. Um, and then signing with Nike, it was all about business. And so mm -hmm. it's now not at a point where I'm running for fun or what, what I love to do, but I was more so focused on things within my contract that said, you know, you need to run this many races. You need to, because honestly, if they're paying you, they're going to be asking things from you, right? And so mm. there were things like the amount of races I needed to run, the times that I needed to hit, um, and all sorts of like things that turned what I love to do into now just a business and work. And so I think that that was one of the things that I didn't know going in. But what I will say from a financial perspective, the main thing <laughs> that I wish I would have known and the story that I love to tell people um, is that for one, the, the deal that I signed with wasn't a huge deal. I wasn't making a lot of money. There's just not a lot of money in track and field. So unless you're like Usain Bolt, mm. like you're not making millions off of track. So although it was great, um, I wasn't making a lot of money, but also um, signing an endorsement deal with a shoe company means that um, you are decked out in the gear of that company because essentially you're representing them. You're, mm -hmm. you're a billboard, a walking billboard for them, if you will. And so I think one of the happiest days was when I got my first Nike shipment. Um, and I just had, I have a picture of it on my Instagram, but there were like boxes of shoes, like any shoes that I wanted, any Nike shoes that I wanted, so <laughs> much clothes, like anything that I could imagine. Um, and so throughout, uh, the time that I was signed with Nike, I got several of these shipments and I was just like basking in it. So fast forward to a time, um, after I had kind of decided I was going to stop running, I was going to refocus my energies on going back to school. And we can talk a little bit about that later. I opened my mailbox and I have a letter from the IRS informing mm. me that I owe about $8,000 worth of taxes on all of the equipment that Nike had sent me. And so wow. as an athlete, you're responsible for paying those taxes. No one told me that. I did not know mm. that. And, and there were other things that I owed taxes on within my tax career, but I just had not been educated on that. And so here I am at this point, transitioning back into school. Um, I'm not really working because I was at school at this point. And to open the mail and see like a big IRS letter that's like, you owe $8,000, $8,000 that I did not have to pay at the time. Mm. Um, that is probably the biggest story that I bring up as far as signing um, a professional contract. And so um, when I look back at the amount of money I was making from Nike versus what I then owed on the free things that they give gave me, it would have been in you know um, my best interest to not have signed and to just kind of run as an independent athlete and not sponsor because I still had access to running in all mm. of the same track meets, um, still you know traveling internationally to run, but I was so caught up on the fact that like. I'm signing with Nike, I made it. And I had no idea that I ended up losing money in the long run because of all the small details that went into it. Wow, I had no idea that that's a thing, but that makes, it, it makes so much sense. It really, it really does. Wow. Yeah, I had no idea either. And so like, I remember the day when I like, walked to my mailbox and got that letter. Like, you know, there's certain events in your life where you just remember where you were at that time. That's one of them for me. I remember the day that I got that letter from the IRS. And it, it took a few years to catch up to me, right? Because Nike reported all of the equipment that they gave me. 
Um, but it takes the IRS a little bit of time to catch up with you. And so at that point, I'd maybe stopped running about a year or two. And here I am getting this letter about something that happened three, three years ago. And it's just like, oh, um, so that inspired me to get in this finance space, um, to work within finance and more specifically to kind of try to start a business around financial education. Yeah, yeah. And and I'm, I'm definitely looking to dive in, dive in a little bit more into that and, and find out a little bit more about, about what channel and, you know, how you're helping a lot of people because I've looked on your Instagram and just see the content that you're sharing. But I'm curious, like, how did you even get into track? Was it like, you know, love at first sight, love that first track, love that first meet? Like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> Yeah, that's another funny story. So I, like I said, I was nine when I started, which is a lot younger than a lot of people, but I was running on like the AAU, like summer track circuit. Um, but the way that I started mm -hmm. actually is like, I was enrolled in dance class. And when I tell you I was so bad, like I was up on stage with two left, you know, like the little ballet classes and stuff, like I was just horrible. And so I think one day my dad was like, enough of this, like, we're going to, we're going to try something. <laughs> we're going to try something else because dance is not for you. Um, and you like to run around everywhere. And so I actually think that the way that it happened is my dad, um, my dad used to work at the YMCA and a local track team asked to like set up a booth to like promote the team or try to get people to sign up. And so when my dad saw that, he was like, well, mm -hmm. she loves running everywhere. I'm going to sign her up. And from then on, it was history. Like, I think that I just had a natural ability to run fast. And so even at nine years old, I was like making it to AAU nationals. I think the very first year I even started running, like I made it to AAU nationals and made it like to the finals in my event, which was nine-year-olds, but it was really competitive. I was running against nine-year-olds from all over the U.S. And so um, that's how I started. It was my sport since nine. And I just, you know, continued to excel through high school and college. And so it was kind of a natural start, but it all started because I was just so bad at dance. So <laughs> they have AAU for track. I did not know that. Yeah. So they have AAU, like an Olympic sports, but then USA track and field also has like a summer track. And essentially it's just like local club team. So each city will mm -hmm. have like a club team. Pretty much every city has one. You just have to know and have an interest in track to know that you can sign your kid up as early as like six years old to start running summer. Summer track is what we call it. Wow. Wow. Okay. Okay. So we, so we went backwards. Now I want to fast forward and then go, go to where like you were j just after you finished competing professionally, how, how did you know it was time to, how did you know it was time to hang them up? Yeah. So I was dealing with an injury that just would not go away, but that I could not, I really identify. And so every time that I ran, I just had this pain in my low back. I literally spent, I don't even want to think about how much money I spent flying to different specialists. Mm. Uh, I found that I just wasn't able to run at the level that I once was. And I was always in pain, like in back pain. And so after kind of spending way too much money trying to go to the best specialist. And I think that it was really difficult for me because like I said, I'd been doing this since I was nine. This is what I loved. Um, but I had to really come to terms with reality and, and, and tell myself or, or sh talk to myself in that I knew that I had a skill set outside of track. So yes, I was really great at track. But I had to really come to terms with the fact that like Brianna, track is what you do. It's not who you are. And so I knew that um, I got my undergrad degree in economics um, from the University of Texas. And that was very intentional because in the time that I was running, I knew that I wanted to make professional track my thing after college. But I also knew that it was important to get a degree that was a bit foundational so that I could mm -hmm. like, whenever the time did come, and I'm, I'm so glad that like 18 year old me was at least present minded enough to think like get a degree in something that you can do something with, even though track is your number one priority right now. Um, and so that's how it kind of came about. I was hurt I, and I, I actually ultimately went back to grad school to get a master's in finance. Um, but had I not gotten that undergrad degree in economics, I don't think I would have been prepared to make that transition as easily as I did. Mm, wow. So for somebody out there who might be 18, might be 20, 
20, whatever age that they might be. And if they're in the position like, like you were, because right, like, like me and you were talking about before, you were just saying how with you and track, track was that thing. You were just locking in. It was just track. It was just track. What, what word of advice would you give to your 18 or your 20, 20 year old self? Like now, based on what you, what you know now? Yeah. I think that it's completely okay to chase after your dream of, of sport or whatever sport you're in a hundred percent wholeheartedly. But at the same time, you can still be preparing yourself for the what if, right? And for mm. me, it was like, what if you get hurt? Or what if it doesn't work out? Or what if you can't compete at this level? Or what if anything happens? And so me setting myself up to, you know, study hard and get this degree in economics did not take away from, you know, me still pursuing my track dream, but it was just also kind of setting me up for the what if. And so like for someone who um, is 18 or in college, I just think it, there's really an importance to like not neglect the academic side, or it doesn't even have to be academic. So let's say that you know, you're an athlete, you play basketball, but you really have this artistic side. Continue to pour into your art, continue to pour into your music, continue to pour into whatever else that may be. Um, and, not, and not so much that it takes away from your sport, but just so that you have something set up for the what if. Mm, nice, nice. And, and I'm, I'm not sure if, if, if you might know or, 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 or not, Brianna, but there's a guy named Larry Sanders. I think his last name is Sanders. And he used to play for the Milwaukee Bucks. And this guy was like, he would put up stats. Like I'm talking about big, big time numbers. And then there came a point to where he just walked away from the NBA. And he, he was just getting to his prime and the dude just left. And then he yeah. was like, I, I, I wanted to leave because of the fact that People knew I was in, in the NBA, family knew I was in the NBA. So everybody was always hitting me up, trying to get some money and this and that. But then he said, I always had a passion for music. And then I, I think he went and started his own label. Now he has like artists and he's yeah. killing it on that side. And I'm like, oh, wow. Exactly. And like his what if was like, what if you just don't want to play anymore? Or like, <laughs> what if you get tired of the sport? Like there can be anything. And so I just think that I completely understand um, because I was that person, like I was so consumed in track, I wanted to be successful in it. And I, looking back, I think I didn't give myself enough credit for the the heights that I was able to reach in the sport. Mm -hmm. But when you are like so involved and so centered around that, it's very hard to kind of take those blinders off and look at what's going on around you. And so even if it doesn't at that moment feel like the best thing to do, like I said, to pour into something else or to, to make sure that you're cultivating something else within yourself. I promise it is the right thing to do. And when you are able to look back on that time, you'll be glad that you did. Yeah, yeah, for, for sure, for sure. So how was that transition for you? Because you said you you were dealing with that injury uh, that, that, that wouldn't go away and that injury that, you know, you struggled to really identify. So with you running track since you were nine, and then now it's like it's time it's time to it's time to hang them up it's time to just move on to to something else like how how was that transition for you yeah it was hard um so i probably should have hung the spikes up a long time before i did but i was so mm. determined and i wasn't going to give up and i wasn't going to quit so um because I had a dream and I had a goal. And so it was a very hard transition, probably for about two to three track seasons, I was dealing with the same injury, the same pain, and I was putting my body through a lot, but I just wouldn't quit. I would get out there on the track, run so slow, but I was not going to give up. And I think that that was part of the transition and that like, I wasn't willing to at that time come to terms with the fact that it's like, it's time to let this go. And so there was a period of time where I was going to grad school and continuing to try to train at the same time because I was still holding on to that like little bitty hope that like maybe one day I would just automatically feel better and it, it didn't happen. Um, and so I think that for me, um, although it was a difficult transition, it was like a new lifestyle. Like I had not not run um, or not trained like that since I was nine. So it was like foreign to wow. me. But I think that I was able to find peace in the fact that I know that I try, like I gave it my all. Like I was out there on the track when I shouldn't have been. I was in pain. I was probably doing everything that I shouldn't have been doing. But 
I can, I, like I said, I flew all over the country trying to see doctors and specialists that could help me figure out what was wrong and why I wasn't feeling like myself. And so exhausting all of that, I think I found comfort in my decision to finally hang up my spikes um, because I know that I, I kind of left it all out there, but it was definitely a hard transition for sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, I think that's major. Cause I think a lot of times it, it's, it's even, I don't want to say harder than what you went through, but just for somebody who know that knew they didn't give it, give it their all. Mm -hmm. So then it's like, no, I just go because I still have something to give, but then they still don't commit to it. They're like halfway doing it. So, I mean, so, so what you saying, you, you've gone, you went all the way in and you know, you really, you really left it out there on the track. I mean, I, I think that I think that puts you in, in, a, in a place where you can have good closure, at least Absolutely. just on, on, on your career. And, yeah, Absolutely. you know, am, amongst all those those accolades that, that mm -hmm. I read off, it's like a recipe in a book, but uh, in a cookbook. But uh, yeah, with, with all those accolades and, and, and what you what you continue to do. So so now talk talk a little bit about like what, what, what are you doing now? And, you know, j just just the work that you're doing. Today. Yeah, so as um, a part of my day job, I work as an analyst for Capital One. Um, and so I'm essentially just a financial analyst there. I've been there for two years. I graduated grad school with my master's in 2018. So I'm at my two year mark there. Um, but also on the side, I've started uh, my own kind of just personal finance um, education business, if you will. Um, and so it's still somewhat in the early stages, but what I do a lot of is I make YouTube videos on just kind of my, I'm, I'm very transparent about my personal finances because I, I think I started in kind of just um, mentoring my friends. And what I found was um, I'm 28 now. And so my, a lot of my friends are around my age, but what I found was that even at 28, so many of my friends don't know the basics about things that they should be doing to set themselves up financially. And I'm not even talking about like super, you know, super complex stock trading, um, trading strategies, mm -hmm. or I'm talking the simple, like open the savings account and like do these things. And so I'm like, there is a gap that needs to be filled here. Um, but I can't say for myself, this is knowledge that I personally went and suck out because I felt like I didn't know everything that I needed to know. And a lot of that stems from what I alluded to earlier with um, that tax situation that I got in. Um, and so I was finding this disconnect and then I started to kind of share on my Instagram and I would share different things that I thought were important for people to know as far as like their student loans, knowing that their student loans are in forbearance right now. And people would write me back and be like, oh my gosh, you just like gave me so much information. And I'm like, I literally just said the most basic thing. You didn't know that? And so I found that there was like this real disconnect. And so I just kind of started to grow it. Um, I made a YouTube channel where I share, like I said, my personal finance story. Um, I share all of my numbers. Like I'm super transparent because I really feel like I'm helping people um, and that's also branched out into me kind of doing work with bankrate.com, which is like a leading financial site. So I've produced content mm -hmm. for them um, as well as the simple dollar. And so it kind of just continues to grow organically, but my whole purpose behind it was kind of like giving the information to people that I really thought need it. And it's been very well received so far. So I'm just like, okay, there may be a space for me in this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'd be the first to tell you that there definitely is a space um, just, just in regards to financial literacy, because just just me being on the side of like student athlete development and seeing just what people are talking about and what they feel that student athletes need to learn, student athletes and students as a need to learn, but they're not. And financial literacy is in the top seven. And I mean, I've polled some people, financial literacy probably in the top three, but yeah. people are saying that this is something that individuals need to learn. And this is beyond essential. And I'm, I mean, I'm 32 now. And I'm really just starting to get a grasp on it. You know, me and my wife, we're, we've been sitting down, crunching out numbers, doing a spending plan instead of a budget. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's like, it's, it, 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 it's, it's so essential. So, I mean, I, I really appreciate the work that you do. And I think you're going to, you're going to help like on your website, it says, you know, create, create freedom. You're going to help a lot of people just get in that space with financial freedom. And then, which would, yeah. I think, end up leading to mental freedom as well. Absolutely. And I think that that's what it's all about. Like, we're not taught these things for a reason. And, and you know, there are different theories as to why we're not taught these things. Um, 
but it's our responsibility to educate ourselves because they're not teaching us. We're not taught in school. Um, and so if I can be just like a sliver of help, if not to give all of the information to at least, you know, a lot of my friends have at least started to think about what they need to be doing financially because of something I've posted on Instagram or something that I've said. And so if I can help in that way, I'm happy to. Sure thing. Sure thing. So what, so what's the end game or what's the, what's the goal for you with, with, with your, with your finance business right now? You know what? I think that I just, I, in, in being an athlete and being a track athlete, I've always like set these goals and then it's been like, I got to go get it and set a goal and got to go get it. And so with this, I think I started that way and I became very frustrated. I'm like, my business isn't growing fast enough. I'm not getting enough YouTube videos. And when I really took a step back and like focused on helping as many people as I could um, and kind of letting things happen organically, I think that, you know, my YouTube channel, I only had a, like a hundred or so subscribers when Bankrate found me. Um, and asked me to produce content for them. And so I have a few videos on their YouTube channel. And so I say that to say, like, I, I kind of want to just let this be organic and see where it goes and let it be more fluid as opposed to being my typical athlete self and saying like, all right, this track season, I have to run 51 seconds. And if I don't, it was a failure of a season. Um, because that's just how I'm wired as an athlete. And I think a lot of athletes can re relate to that. It's just like, that is our nature. And so I'm kind of trying to explore new ways of doing things. But what I found and what I really like is that as soon as I let go of the reins, like opportunities presented themselves, even, you know, the opportunity to be on this podcast. And so I think that um, it's just an op awesome opportunity. And so I can't really say that I have a goal with it. I definitely would love to grow, but more than anything, to just try to help as many people as I can. Dope, dope, dope. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, you know, if I could be a resource in any way, please let me know because I, I, I think it's amazing. I think it's, it's, it's definitely necessary. Um, so, so thank you for, for all that you do, Brianna, and, you know, just the way that you're helping people because financial literacy, like, like I mean, like, like I said before, is just super empowering. You know, when, when you make that last payment and, and you know that, yeah. boom, I don't owe anything else in this credit card anymore. And I, I, did, I did it twice this year. So I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, that's it, awesome. it was really that's good. Yeah, that, because that's huge. Like, that's huge. And so that, yeah, that's awesome. But I absolutely understand exactly what you're talking about. Hopefully I can get there on my student loans. Definitely. I, I had to take student loans to go back to grad school. So I'm hoping that I can get to that point. <laughs> it may not be soon, but I'm working towards it. <laughs> yeah, student loan. I have a house note for student loans, but we're not going to talk about me. This is your episode. We're not going to talk about me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, but I, I've, I've definitely enjoyed our time today. And I'm almost going to let you go. But before I do that, I have to run you through the two minute drill. Okay. Okay, and the, 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 the two minute drill is just where I ask you a few rapid fire questions, a handful of rapid fire questions. And then j this just allows the, the ballers out there to see you just from a slightly different light and you know, just to get inside of your head a little bit. So sure. are you ready? I'm ready, let's do it. Okay, here we go. Favorite food? Salmon. <laughs> oh, how you like it prepared? Um, in the air fryer. I don't know if that, <laughs> look, I just got hit oh. to the air fryer and it has changed my life. So I just got one too. <laughs> I just got one too. So I'm, I'm, I'm right, I'm right there with you. Well, what's the last book you read? Oh, um, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man by Emmanuel Acho. I actually had the opportunity to interview him at work. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Emmanuel Acho, but if not, check him out. Um, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. I. I spearheaded a project. Sorry, this is not rapid fire, but I'm excited about Go it. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Talk well, about I it. I brought him into, come into Capital One. Um, it was a lot of work on my part, but we got to have a really cool conversation in front of like 2,000 plus Capital One associates about just um, inclusion, race issues. And um, it was literally something that I dreamed up back in June and brought it to light. So I just read his book. I actually have it right here. So. Super dope. Yeah, I, I actually saw I saw the clip on your Instagram. I saw the yeah. clip on your Instagram. Yeah. So that, that's that's super dope. C congrats on that. Congrats on that. Thank you. Uh, oh, okay. Now we'll dive back in. Uh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> no, no, no. It's cool. It's cool. It's cool. Uh, your, your your favorite podcast? Ah, uh, the Joe Budden podcast. 
<laughs> um, mm. I don't know if I should say that. I love the Joe Budden podcast. Why? What's wrong with that? It's your favorite I don't podcast. Know. It, it's a little, it gets a little ratchet sometimes, but um, look, I, I'm an avid listener, so I love it. I mean, we all have our LinkedIn persona and we all have our Twitter persona. So that's, that's completely fact. fine. That's a fact. Most underrated cereal? Cheerios, Honey Nut Cheerios. Good answer, good answer. And then last, last, last question, last question. You can take your time on this. What's one tip that you want to leave for a student athlete? Okay, yeah, let me take my time. Okay, just like I said earlier, you go go after your dream, go after it 100% full throttle, but also have something on the side for your what if. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And this is just a bonus question. Who would you like to see have on Beyond the Ball next? Mm, it might be a stretch. I don't think it will be, but Emmanuel Acho. I think that his transition from a football player at Texas to having a short career in the NFL and now being one of the top sports anchors out there. Um, I would love to see him. I think it would be great. Um, and I think that once everything with the book dies down and he's not super busy because I know booking him was hard, I think that he would be absolutely willing to do it. Um, so I would love to hear him here. Okay, okay. I mean, I'll, I'll reach out, but if, if you got the plug, hey, if you got the plug, <laughs> I'm, I'm fine with that too. Oh, man. Uh, but but uh, Brianna, go ahead and let everybody know where they can connect with you, where they can follow you, and also just find out about the great things that you're doing. Absolutely. Um, I You can follow me on Instagram. Um, I am Brianna Nelson. Um, and then YouTube, if you just search Brianna Nelson, you can find me and my videos there. Um, and I think that Instagram is the best place to go. I have a link in my bio where you can kind of get everywhere else, like my website. So I won't rattle out everything here, but just I am Brianna Nelson on Instagram. Certainly. Everybody be sure to follow her. I, I saw she was she was doing something cool. A, a few. Well, I think it might have been on your website where, where you had like a freebie for people like to download. Yeah, uh, absolutely. If you go there, hit the link, go to my website, you can download a free budget template that I've built, which is all pre-populated for you. All you have to do is put in your numbers. And I really encourage you to use it because it's extremely helpful. Definitely, definitely. So everybody make sure to take advantage of that. And then after you do that, be sure to send, send Brianna a DM and say, I downloaded the template. Now I'm going to use it. And then also just shoot her a DM and, and, and encourage her, let her know what you got from this episode and, and let her know that you took something away. So uh, Brianna, thank you for your time here today, hanging out with the ballers and myself. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. It's been great. It's been a lot of fun. Excellent. Excellent. Glad to hear it. Now, everybody out there listening, be sure to take your take time and uh, subscribe to Beyond the Ball wherever you listen to podcasts. Be sure to subscribe, share it with one friend. And until next time, I'm Jonathan Jones, and this is Beyond the Ball, where we help you succeed beyond your degree.